Hello. Hi, is this Robert? Hi, uh, yes, it is. All right, let me do the official introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, we are very excited to welcome our featured guest for this evening. He is an actor, he is also directed, and he is a writer, I hear. We're very honored to welcome the one and only Robert F. Lyons to the show. You're on the air with Terry and Tiffany. Welcome. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. You know, you'll be glad to hear that we have received so many requests of people that admire you, not only uh, fans and people that watch films, but other filmmakers and other actors that really appreciate your work. Well, oh, that's exciting. I don't know that. I know of one, only one. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's more than that, and that's for sure. Uh, you really had, yeah. you really had an interesting career. I, I mean, we started out by calling you uh, a character actor, and we didn't really know whether that was a, a term you'd appreciate or not. I guess that that's probably the best way to describe you, right? Yeah, it's not an insult at all. Uh, I've done things that people don't even recognize me, so I guess that's character. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I think it's cool being a character actor. I mean, it's it's that thing that where sometimes people don't always recognize uh, your name, but they certainly recognize your face because, you know, when you've been on as much as, as what you've had, uh, been on, you know, and it, it definitely puts you in a category. But you, you've done really a lot of wide and, and varied things. I guess when you first started out, you were actually in I Dream a Genie. I was uh, under contract to Screen Gem Studio mm -hmm. in the late 60s. Um, when they were connected to Columbia, they were a subsidiary to Columbia Screen Gems. Right. And um, yes, it was a. I did several of those small parts there. That's partly how I got started here in uh, Hollywood, California. Well, let's kind of go back a little bit and talk about uh, kind of your origin and, and how you got involved in acting. Because I know that we recently had a buddy of yours, Jesse Lee Vint the Third, on, and he had a, a very interesting story as far as how he kind of turned to acting. So, what about you, Robert? How did you get involved and get the the performing bug? It's always been a last thing, and it was something that I, I tell you, I simply just went there. Mm -hmm. I had no sit down, should I do this, should I do that? It was just something I knew of. We lose him? Hello? Hello? Uh oh, I think we lost him. All right, let's try connecting again. <laughs> just some alert just came in on the phone and cut us off. Oh, yeah, okay. That's weird. Yeah, are you back? Yeah. Yes, I'm here. Okay, great, great. Those, anyway. those alerts always scare the hell out of me. You never, <laughs> <laughs> it's like, you know, in these kind of times, it's like, okay, well, the end of the world is happening now. So. <laughs> yeah, there was a little bit of that, like, uh-oh, what now? <laughs> um, but you were talking I about... Like yeah, I grew up watching films on the weekend. That's uh -huh. what we did as kids in my own town, which was Auburn in New York. You, every Sat Friday and or rather every Saturday and Sunday, yeah. you saw two features on each day: <laughs> <laughs> cartoons, a serial, news. They had news uh, reels back then, right? Yeah. Actual news, and uh, you just did that every week. I don't know. I never. I, I don't know that I would have been good at anything else. I really don't. Uh, nine to five was not my thing. Uh, but working from six in the morning till six the next day on film, that would be okay. Right. For some reason, I was never bothered by the length of time working all night. Uh, see, that's where we differ. I, I've done a, a little acting, nothing major, but. My God, you have to be there at the crack of dawn like you're a farmer, and it was, <laughs> and it's very long hours. And people think it's easy. It's not easy at all. No, definitely not easy. But uh, when you turn around and got started out in in doing uh, TV episodes and stuff, uh, a lot of the roles that you seem to get cast for is kind of like an action, kind of a tough guy, uh, a guy that could kick your ass on screen or. or uh, have a woman fall in love with them quite easily. Why do you think you got cast as those uh, kind of characters? I mean, was there something about your persona that they picked up on that, or how did that seem to happen? That's a great question. Uh, Thank you. 
wow. Um, I had a great teacher in New York, and I had a great class in New York, and part of it was like being compared to the best actors at the time, and you worked in class to try to uh, do the, uh, similar things, yeah. and you would choose similar material, or you would work on it in ways that you could bring that passion out for life. And uh, I think that had a lot to do with it. It didn't matter the role. After a while, you were going to do your work, and your work consisted of trying to bring as much of a variety emotionally right. and the full spectrum to any character you did. It didn't matter the character. You just had to try to find that. And I just had, was lucky with uh, some of the teachers that I had. And I was just lucky that... They showed me ways and pushed ways, and I learned to observe the best actors, I think, at the time, and you draw from them as well. I don't mean that you copy them, but you you do what they do in your own way, if that makes sense. But at any point, you know, in, in getting cast with these kind of characters as villains and so on and so forth, did it ever concern you that, that you wanted to play something different, but you kind of thought maybe they're just, you know, making you the bad guy all the time? No, I, I there's plenty of things I did when I wasn't the bad guy. Yeah. Um, uh, I would ask for it. I mean, there's a film I did where they wanted me to play another guy. It wasn't a bad guy. And I said, no, nah, I want the girl here. There you go. And, and they said, well, we got someone. I said, fine. I said, I don't want the part you want. They called me two weeks later and said, hey, guess what? You can have it. <laughs> so sometimes you just got to ask for it. Uh, it's it's funny. Uh, maybe that's luck. I don't know. I asked for it, and uh, they gave it to me. What yeah. can I tell you? Interesting. I, I love uh, the story of... Uh, go ahead. No, I was going to say, my mother used to have a... <laughs> used to say uh, her biggest concern was do you, do you die in this one I mean she had to watch me <laughs> or she would tell her friends you got to see him tonight on such and such a show he lives in this one he doesn't get shot and I can imagine I can just hear your mother in my head telling all her friends uh, well, he he's a villain tonight but he's not really a bad boy <laughs> you know? a good kid <laughs> such well, a good kid it was so uh, it was just I guess she just had to wipe, get me, watch me get wiped out so many times. It was just, no, no, that's my boy. It's yeah. kind of funny. It was like a family thing, you know. Well, you never she know great. the way it's going to go when you first get in, into stuff. And the, the thing that was lucky about you, and, and this really helps a person's career, is when you started out, you got to land roles aside some really big people, uh, such as Gregory Peck. Now, now to turn around and, and be you know, kind of at the beginning of your career and wind up and, and acting with somebody like that. Now, I know you're a movie fan, you're a TV fan. What was it like for you to turn around and act with somebody that was so legendary? Were you perhaps a fan? What a great question. I, I First of all, to grow up and, and I'd seen him on the screen and then to meet a famous director that directed that film yeah. with, called Shootout with right. Dick. Um uh, first of all, he was such a gentleman. Wow. And he was just as warm and personal both off screen as he was on. I mean, you were talking to him off screen. It was like watching him on the film. He was the same. Uh, just a man of honor. Uh, he loved humor. Uh, we talked about that. He wanted to do comedy. But he said, no, nah, they see me as sort of a sad character, so... Yeah, he, he loved doing Roman Holiday. Uh, that was one of his favorite because that was a comedy. Um, but he was just a wonderful guy to talk to, and I had great stories for him. I have to tell you, wow, what a guy! Um, I just felt very fortunate. Uh, also, he's a very big man. He's very tall. I, I mean, and, you, yeah. it had to be something to just sit there and just just take in all of these stories which were you know more than likely old hollywood because he'd done everything well yeah he had done just about everything and there was a scene there's a scene in there where i have to slap him 
and I have a gun on him, and he doesn't have any guns. And you know, when you do scenes like that, you you really rehearse them easy and slow, and so nobody gets hurt. Mm -hmm. And he was a wonderful man. He said, "Bob, I'm going to take the slap, and I'll take it here." And I said, oh, "Okay." And we rehearsed it; everything was fine. And then, when the camera was rolling, somebody probably got off the mark, and I hit him upside the head. <laughs> I it caused a uh, a little blood vessel popped. He stayed in the sea, and at the end. They said, "Cut!" He went. Oh, the kid got me. You know, <laughs> I I almost died. I was like, "No, no, no! This can't be. This cannot have happened." And about a late hour later, I went over to his dressing room, knocked on the door, and he came out. I said, "Hey, hi!" I said, "Oh, I'm so sorry." He said, "No, I forget it. Are you kidding? <laughs> this is how this kind of stuff happened." I said, "Yeah, but you got to see it from my point of view." I said, "I just punched Gregory Peck in the head." <laughs> <laughs> he laughed. He, he got it. He knew. He laughed and he said, "Oh, listen, it's happened before." Now, see that that I have such it. a respect for that. I mean, that's old Hollywood. You get some of these new actors and they'd be crying and complaining and talking to sag. And <laughs> <laughs> now, this, there's a little, very little to complain about. This is a business. I don't like that. And I just wrote it up a little bit. Was I used to tell a student, there's what you call acting mm -hmm. and acting plus. And acting plus is all the stuff you can never plan for, but it's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes you have more acting plus than you have acting. I'm serious. I mean, it's just, it's just the way it rolls. It depends on the location where you are. It depends on the diff different kinds of people you have working both crew and uh, cast uh, have been very fortunate. In most cases, it's been just wonderful. Uh, only once in a while did you get to work with an idiot somewhere. Yeah. Right, right. Well, let me... And there's damn few... Let me ask you about what was uh, your feature film debut. Uh, you were in a film called Pendulum in 1969. And what was it like walking into a film? You are at this point, a fairly newcomer and working with people like George Papard. It was ex so damn exciting, I can't tell you, uh, <laughs> to get your first movie role. And personally, I had the best part in that film. Um, I had the one part that's going in the opposite direction that everyone else is. Mm -hmm. So for a beginner, I mean, I had done a lot of plays back east. And uh, even on Broadway, off Broadway, I had done some what they call summer stock. Out here, people don't even know what that is, but that's doing plays in a summer, small town, right. eight, eight plays during the summer. And so I had done a lot of that, and the parts on TV were growing a little bit. So I was ready to go. And it's like you, you, you found yourself at a great part at the same time. It just worked out. And I'm what you call a motion guy. I move a lot. I'm <laughs> mm -hmm. I got them to do things for me. That was, uh, I just thought that's what you usually do. I found out later it's not. I, I got them to make a, a set wall solid so I could literally climb it in that film. And they, they just allowed me to go nuts because that was the character. Right. And I and explained myself as well as I could. And they just said, sure, we'll do that. We can do that. And uh, that frees you up, too. It's supportive that uh, people trust your ideas. I mean, when you think about it, like Gary Oldman said to me, all we do is ideas. I can't believe we're selling ideas. <laughs> 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 I had to take a look at that. I said, that's it. That's all it is. It's just one idea against another idea. That's all it is. Yeah. And you either accept it or you don't, or you get known for it, and... Uh, your choices are your ideas, so it gets to be a fun game. And, and the thing about movies like that, too, is, is people, like I said earlier, don't realize how much hard work it is in doing something like this. And it is physically taxing. I mean, obviously, you did a lot of uh, your own stunts, and you said you know people like Gregory Peck was taking punches from you and everything. 
Uh, was there ever a time that you ever got hurt doing something, or perhaps maybe uh, you're you're dealing with ailments now from back in the day? I know we talked to Sid Haig before he passed, and uh, he was getting to the point to where he was almost crippled because of car crashes he had to do. No, I I, I know exactly what you mean. I'm, I on horses, I was so glad that I always had somebody that uh, could really look at my style and be me on, on a horse. I mean, stunt guys who do that are really terrific people. I gotta right. tell you, they're wonderful actors in a way because they get your rhythm, they get your muscular moves. And there was a guy, uh, I wish I had, could recall his name, that he would make that horse gallop so fast. And I thought, my God, I looked at that, that looks like me riding a horse. It is not. Mm -hmm. And I, I would have fallen off going that fast. I cannot keep my feet in the stirrups. It's just funny. I mean, I, I see it, Weston, I see it, my feet. <laughs> <laughs> but not the, I just cannot keep them in. I'm not Gary Cooper, that's for sure. These guys look great on a horse. Right. You know? Well, at least you're honest. I, I love the stories of actors who uh, during the audition process that are asked you know, about riding a horse and, and they lie and they say they can ride a horse to get the role and they find out they can't. <laughs> <laughs> it's a whole different story. That is exactly what happened to me when I first got out here. Wow. I did a thing called The Loner, uh -huh. which was a half hour western with Lloyd Bridges. Right. Uh, it, was just a, it was on for one season. And I had only been here two weeks. And uh, at that time, New York actors were a premium out here. You know, in New York, you got the job. They didn't even audition me. Mm. But the thing is about riding horses or jumping off of diving boards. In an acting class, you don't do that stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you, <laughs> right. <laughs> you come to California, you have to learn how to drive all kinds of vehicles and be able to stop right where the camera is. You have to do it. Now, when you get on a horse that's 17 and a half hands high, and the horses that the Wranglers would bring in are super spirited. These guys want to go. They're not barn sour horses that, <laughs> you know, you pay five bucks for an hour. Right. These guys want to go. Yeah. And if you don't know how to handle it, you've got... It's like you got a half a ton of force on you, and you're not in control. And the damn horse knows it. I scattered a crew. I literally did. <laughs> wow. Well, it definitely helped to ride a horse. You did uh, so many things of, of that kind of era. And uh, you were on, like, the premium Western TV show, Gunsmoke. Uh, do you have any scenes with James Ernest? No. Well, he, he was just a wonderful guy. And, and uh, you know, he just... He was just there. I didn't have a lot to do with him. Mm -hmm. um, Vic French, Victor French was an actor at the time, very well known for the series that he did. Uh, and he was a good friend with uh, Landon, Michael Landon. Yeah, uh, he, he, Highway to Heaven, I believe, yeah. Yeah, I think he did uh, the Prairie thing, too. Yeah. Um, yeah, Little House on the Prairie. Yes, and I think Victor even started to direct. So. Victor had a, a big part in that particular gun smoke I did, and Carol O'Connor was also was a episode I think was called Major Glory. Mm -hmm. So there were a lot of guys who were better known for me. That was my first actually kind of major part on television was the one I did on Gun Smoke. Yeah, and uh, I loved it. Uh, it was a good part for me. No, good part those uh, shows hold up so well. I mean, they're they're on some cable service called uh, uh, Friendly TV. They have a bunch of channels like that, and it just, it looks so good because the way they shot it, it was just like theatrical film. I mean, style. It, it just looked beautiful. Yeah, it was terrific. I, that particular show, because it was so much action, you had to do so many things, and uh, thank God I didn't have to ride horses. <laughs> <laughs> now I, I, I had, go ahead I, I have to ask you though because we're all about the drive-in type of cinema here 
And one of the films that you did fairly early on in your career is was directed by somebody who we've become friends with uh, recently. And he's going to be doing the show uh, coming up here soon. And that is you did a film called Getting Straight that was directed by Richard Rush. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that film and what it was like working with Richard? Because, of course, he was known for doing a lot of kind of counterculture films. Yeah, no, that's wonderful. No, Richard was very special. <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, a couple of years ago, I think it was on the 45th anniversary, they just ran it out here in Santa Monica. It was good to see it again on the live screen. It was a great part. Again, that was also Columbia. Um, we actually filmed it in Eugene, Oregon, 1969, the summer of 1969. And uh, he actually gave me the whole character in one line. Mm -hmm. And I, I went, wow, that's never happened before. Usually directors, um, they kind of get to know you quick. And the smart directors leave you alone. If you're good and you're coming up with some good creative stuff, they don't say anything. And we rehearsed the first scene, which is my first scene in the film. And which is unusual to shoot in a chronological order. For me, it happened that way for the first scene. And it was a line, something about, I owe him money. Harry Bailey, played by Ella Gould, asked me, do you have the, Nick, do you have the money you owe me? And I said, yeah, yeah, I got it written down. And he said to me, no, it's like the greatest thing you owe him money. And that set the whole tone for the character. Yeah. That it's a wonderful thing that I own. Yeah, no, man, I get it written out. You know, so <laughs> <laughs> like, what? Isn't that great? I lo owe him money. And I thought, what a wonderful idea. It set me up for the entire character. Mm. Well, I love the fact that, you know, you, you not only do the, the big studio films, but you do what we refer to as the drive-in film or the B-movie. And uh, we, we've had kind of a history with uh, talking to people uh, that has done the uh, movies of the Angel series. Uh, we had Donna Wilkes in studio, did the original Angel, and uh, you uh, acted with a different actress who played Angel in Avenging Angel. Now, you were really great in that film. Oh, thanks. No, no, yeah. Um, I took over a part that another New York actor played the captain or sergeant or something like that of the police. And I also had worked with her... Uh, and helping her because she was a young actress right. and I knew a lot of things and uh, the director Bob O'Neill I was, was his name uh, he had written the original and this was the one coming up so that was a lot of fun uh, good part he cut me loose you can do a lot by then I was feeling kind of confident on my choices right. to do whatever you want and, uh, you know, these guys just cut you loose. They kind of hire you because they know you're going to bring something to it. And, and you're not an argumentative guy. I, you know, I'm willing to listen to any direct. I only had one or two things that in my whole career where I go, what the hell is happening? Mm -hmm. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> you know, but uh, and I thought that's pretty good for all those years. Now, how do you approach, as an actor, how do you approach a role differently when you're portraying a real-life person? Like, for example, in the Todd killings, you know, that was based on the true story of uh, 60s killer Charles Schmidt. So how yeah. how is that different? I mean, are you worried about being as close as possible to the real guy, or do you still try to put your own influence in there? Oh, that's a great question. You guys really come up with a good one. <laughs> um, uh, I had wanted to go and talk to him. At that time, he was still alive and in prison. And uh, they went, no, no. Apparently, they were already receiving threats of lawsuits, blah, blah, blah. And a lot of times, you'll see in a film, it says, based on the story. Right. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, yeah, when it says based, it's going very far from a duplication of what actually occurred. First of all, we don't look alike. The director had many different ideas of how to go about this. 
Uh, he had directed other films with teenage kids in it. There were a lot of teenagers in this one. Um, so I never got to meet him, but I did hear some radio things that he actually said. And I took one out and actually put the exact words in that he had stated. Um, there's a scene there where I'm being interviewed. And I listened to what he said on the radio. I just lifted it out, put it right in the script where he said, I didn't do this, God is on my side, and he will witness you, and he started to cry and do all this mm -hmm. nonsense. So I looked at it out and put it right in. And to further answer your question, no, you just start to uh, make your own choices of how you feel it is, you know? Uh, I don't know, I come from a very hardcore acting New York place. You know, uh, same as Jesse, uh, Jesse Vince, who you already had on. You know, we came from uh, guys from teaching tough. You had to do it. You had to come up with the ideas. So yeah. I, I combine, you combine what you know. To me, acting is what you know, what you've seen, and it's a script and your imagination. And what's the best I can do with this? How, how much can I really... Uh, entertain how much can I not just entertain but but to really do my work and be honest with it right well you attended the American Academy of Dramatic Arts you had such great teachers as Stella Adler and, and, and so on I mean that's great training and I think another thing that, that helped you uh, basically take the attitude you, you took is, is you went to a tough military school <laughs> so true Oh, why? Where are you guys getting all this <laughs> This information, my God. I feel like I've been, you know, that's interesting. Uh, yeah, and and believe it or not, the uh, four years of military school did help me in a way. Um, uh, I'm not crazy about it, uh, the schooling. I wasn't academically, uh, I wasn't that quick. I couldn't stand it. But there were certain things that that school helped me with, if that makes sense. Um, I'm not really explaining it, except the military aspect, because of doing military in films. I actually was given a role in Patton and turned it down. Wow. Uh, yeah, can you believe it? I was going to play Patton's aide, mm. and then actor Stephen Young, he wound up playing him. So I was given two parts the same day. It's always a problem. Sometimes you get two parts the same day. Now, it sounds like, well, you can't lose. Well, you can, right. uh, depending, on, <laughs> depending on which part you take. And the I, part I took, uh, we never made the film that paid us off, and we uh, never made uh -huh. it. I can foresee you so, getting along very well with George C. Scott. Yeah, I don't know. It would have been interesting. Uh, I had seen him in New York as a kid and on Broadway, when he did Andersonville Trial, you know, the the Civil War um, play mm -hmm. about the terrible Confederate uh, prison mm -hmm. and how uh, the Union soldiers were treated. So it was more torture than I did. Anyway, he, I had seen him on Broadway. I certainly loved him in The Hustler as a kid. We used to go and shoot pool where they filmed it in New York anyway at Ames mm -hmm. Brothers. And, but I never met the man. And... Uh, I never got to Spain either where they filmed it. Mm. Mm. But well, uh, I did meet another friend that I did get to work with later on, Frank D. Felita, and uh, because he had written that film called The Color of Evening, mm -hmm. from a book by Robert Nathan. It was about a young painter and an old painter. There were only four people in the cast, so I took that and turned down Patton, and we never filmed it. Mm. So and, that's and one of the... Uh, OG type moments in this business. Yeah, and yet Patton became what? One of the legendary films of our time. <laughs> <laughs> but everybody has yeah. those things that happen. It's, it's, I don't know whether it's good to say, gee, I should have, or just not ever have any regrets. I don't know. You know? I, no, it makes an interesting talk on the set. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it, it's interesting about your military background, and, and you do get a lot of tough guy roles, and maybe that played into it. But I guess this plays your sensitive side. You were a tap dancer at six years old. Yeah. Public <laughs> school. There you go. 
50 cents, 50 cents a lesson. No, those things I could do. I was very, uh, it came almost too easy for me. I wished, I wished I'd really stayed in dance much more. I can't tell you. I, I push my students to, to study it because it's important. It gives you a sense of your body, what you can do with it. It keeps it alive. It's fun. It gives you rhythm. Uh, you can do things with it. You talk about a workout. Let me tell you, you tap dance for an hour class. You, you've done it all. You've gotten every cell in your body moving. <laughs> so it's, it's good. I did take tap later on. It's just one of those things that I should have kept up, you know, as a teenager. Uh, that's all, when I was in New York. Well, it helps your movement. It helps you uh, have poise and direction. But it also helps you duck a, a fist coming at you. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, some yeah. of those action things. Now, of yeah. course, we have to we have to talk about uh, a film which I, I guess you could call it a, a kind of an independent type film, but this film has such a following, and uh, that is Black Oak Conspiracy. And we actually, I, I have a little something to read you, Robert, because we had actually heard from Jesse Lee Vint. And he had uh, said the following, and I wanted to share this with you on the air. He says, I first met Bobby Lyons at the Actors Studio in 1968. I was new in town. He had been working frequently in television and films, so I learned a lot from him. I have always been impressed by his talent, and so I hired him to do a film that I was producing, writing, and starring in called Black Oak Conspiracy. He turned out to be the total professional that he was reputed to be, with no bad habits and 100% reliability. We had a great cast in that film, and Bobby was one of the most electric performers I had ever seen. When he enters screen, the tension is always raised considerably. In a word, he is fun to watch. He and I were competing for the lead actress in this movie, Karen Carlson, who had just finished a starring part as Redford's wife in The Candidate. The, this culminated in an on-the-screen fist fight between he and I. I got the girl, but the fight was rigged, which was okay with me. Bobby has always done well as a screenwriter, which not too many people are aware of. Ask him about all of his scripts. He has also taught acting privately to many name actors in the film industry, including the likes of people like Priscilla Presley. I have been in Portland for over 10 years, but when I came back to town, we reconnected and have since had dinner at our favorite places, the Casa Vega and Musso Franks. He is one of the best people I have ever known. Now, I, I feel like we're doing a This Is Your Life. Do you have somebody <laughs> that, that respects you so much after all this time? I mean, he was a fellow actor and, in fact, your boss because he hired you for the film and he's got such great respect for you. But uh, I noticed he made point to let us know that he got the girl. <laughs> is that true? <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, he got the girl, I think, more and more. Actually, he and Karen, I think, uh, went together for a while, as uh, memory serves me correctly. No, that was, listen, that was Jesse. Uh, listen, he's a guy, more like a Renaissance guy. He was daring enough to go and produce and star in a film. And uh, he put it together. He yeah. got that thing together. <laughs> Anyone who knows filmmaking, all the little pieces of information that it takes and the details and all the actions you have got to do. I mean, I've made some short films and I can tell you all the things you have to do when you produce it, it's almost like staggering. When you look back, you right. go, I couldn't have done that. Yeah. Well, it, it's just, you get into it and you're just moving. You're moving like 24 seven and it's done and suddenly you got a product and you like it and whatever. So doing that, I knew Jesse. I knew all the Vince, all three of them. Um, we used to play uh, games together, the four of us. We used to fly model airplanes and crash them into one another. We were a little nuts. <laughs> <laughs> I know that, I don't think he told you about that. No. But we, Oh, we would build these planes, these balsam wood planes, and go out, put engines on them, fly them around, and try to bash each other out of the sky. We would have a riot, and uh, it was just fun, because we were all actors, and we all wanted to do well. And, uh, you know, when you're young, and you're hungry, and you love it, and 
unfortunately, that love has never stopped. And I don't think it ever stopped for Jesse or whatever. Well, it's a certain thrilling experience. It's something you love to do. Uh, to me, acting is not hard work. It's a joy. There is a joy in creating. And uh, I think we both come from that kind of ilk and uh, like to go. And I must say that was a wonderful thing that he stated about me. Wow, that is really special. I did not know it. I had only heard part of that show. I only heard a couple of moments from it. So mm -hmm. I will have to call him and bang him on the head for, for making me sound such like a cool guy. Well, you're, you're very lucky to have known him and worked with him. And, and I can't wait. I've had opportunities, but I can't wait till this, this epidemic thing is over with because I want to hang out with him because he's such a, son, a fun guy and he, what you see on screen is what you get and i can only imagine that you know on on any given set that it must include liquor and women so that's <laughs> <laughs> that's for me i mean you know but but he's a very yeah. cool guy well what was it like because uh, he likes to talk about your on-screen fight. He said that was one of the greatest on-screen fights he was ever in. Knowing that you knew him as well as you did, how did that go? Did it go exactly as planned? Anything go wrong? And, and can you talk about that great fight scene in Black Oak Conspiracy? Well, I, uh, I have not seen the film uh, for quite a while. And I have located just recently a copy of it. And because of the virus thing going on right now, I, I don't know if I can get over there and, and get a copy because it hasn't been available. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like so many of the films we've both done. Um, and we both just have, <laughs> we both have a lot of funny, wonderful stories about filmmaking. I mean, it's just, it goes on and on. And we're not the only guys. It's just, there are just stories. It just happens, stuff happens when you're making a movie that if sometimes you just don't think people would believe it that's funny that what he said the fight scene was was scripted and there was a wonderful director who i worked by the way bob kelch and i worked with a couple of times afterwards that jesse had gotten bob it was a wonderful guy there was just funny things that had happened and uh the fight scene was staged. It was staged well. I think there was a thing where I had to put a cigar out on his face. Mm -hmm. That was like a cruel, vicious thing. And he, and I have guys that are holding him while this is going on. Right. And I, I and I, you know, there's always stunts like that. So you got to make sure you're doing it right. Nobody gets harmed or hurt or really burned. Um, you know, so I guess we made it go right, but um, I'd have to see it again to give you a really uh, moment to moment to go, yeah, that's it. That's just part of it. We work this stuff out, and you make it as believable as you can. Well, the, the whole scene where you were talking to Jesse in the film, your character, and he was talking about setting him on fire, I mean, that, that really got right to the core of what kind of character you played. I, I mean, you were like the total king asshole in that movie. <laughs> yeah, something like that. Uh, that's that's a fact. Uh, yeah. It was good. Uh, I still have the boots he, he gave me from the set. <laughs> I still wear the boots, the cowboy boots. That's funny. Now, tell us a little bit, uh, because Jesse told me to ask now, tell us a little bit about uh, your scripts. I, I understand that you're a screenwriter, too. Yeah, I sold um, one, but it's changed so many times. Uh, you got to understand, if you're not the writer on a script all the way till its completion as a film, uh, other people can get in there and change it and this and that. So mm -hmm. I was lucky enough to... Um, get a script of mine sold and uh, or option let's say option and, the, and and then you write it and you write it and they keep taking options and then that uh, company that did that then sold everything they had to Disney and Disney picked it up and said look we want to pay you off and I went okay and they gave me a lot of money mm. Um, I took an idea. There was a wonderful actor. I'm sure you would remember Jeffrey Lewis. Mm 
Yes. Yes. Love him. He was a dear, dear friend of mine for many, many years. I knew him since uh, 1970. One of my favorite actors and, of all time. He's a wonderful guy. Miss him. Oh, yeah. I, I miss him. I cannot tell you. Also, Jeffrey trusted me to, you know, he had a certain role. He'd come over and we'd talk and I would work with him on it. And we just knew each other for years. He had done early work and he did some plays and he was... I got him a part, it was always a tease thing with him, I got you a first part in a movie. He played a part, uh, an actor fell out and they needed somebody in a hurry. Mm -hmm. And somebody mentioned his name and I said, you gotta take this guy and the director took him on, that was Jeffrey. And he came in and just did a, a quick thing. Jeffrey and I did two or three films together, by the way. Anyway, we're going off on this, but, but um, anyway, yeah. He's a good guy. I've lost my thought here. Well, you were we talking about, about your script that was optioned and then bought out by Disney. Yeah, and and uh, it was about a train. You know, it was terrorists on a train. Actually, Jeffrey had the idea of terrorists in, um, what was that called? Terrorists in oh, like a simple little town. Mm -hmm. And I put, I put the script to it. And... Uh, sold it and we both had the same manager at the time and the guy sold it he had I had what you call a scratch script meaning you don't show it to anyone it's just uh, that's the first draft it's done and he had shown it to them and they wanted it I couldn't believe it wow. terrorists trained actually what happened is Disney wanted it they just wanted the train <laughs> it was rewritten <laughs> <laughs> oh, they were afraid of the terrorists, huh? <laughs> yeah. Wow. No, well, at that point, I didn't even care if I got into it because I, I you know, the script was sold. Stole, sold. Yeah. Uh, got a couple right now that I am just finishing up on, and hopefully we can all get back to it and get through this virus and get yeah. them out there. And get them made. That's the fun thing. Yeah, I, I think it, was, it. I think it was you on on Facebook. I think I saw you having a conversation with Jesse. It was in one of my threads, and uh, something I'd posted. And you and Jesse were talking, and I think you talked about that you had a script, and and Jesse's really trying to encourage you to get it done. Yeah, I mean, he has one that he wrote. That if you read it, it's one of the best things I've read. In, in recent years. I mean, this is his writing. Yeah, I mean, he's talking about mine, but I, I read his thing and I'm going, this is outrageous. Yeah. It is just, whoa. I mean, uh, of what is necessary out there today and really terrific. I mean, Tarantino to me is just like the guy. Yeah. Right. You know, and, and everyone agrees that he has brought his own style right his own, he, he's an originator and which is never easy but all of his stuff was original very and yet works i mean that stuff sometimes you read that on a page and you go how the hell are you gonna do this yeah. uh even when you are well healed in acting and you understand direct you understand it i mean if you're alert and alive and really observant when you're making a movie, you learn. You will just learn. All day you are learning and doing and learning. And it's not an effort. It's a joy. This is not some... You know, if you love this business, I tell you, you can only learn. I'm still learning at this juncture. I saw some TV things last night and I went, damn, I, now I understand the business. Yeah. I'm not kidding. <laughs> Well, I, I'm yeah, sure you can way. recognize things that are, that are done nowadays that, that ties into the vein of the way things used to be. I mean, you know, having worked with the people you worked with. Uh, there's one person I've got to ask you about that I know you worked with that, that, you know, you talk about intimidation. I've talked to other people that's worked with him, too. I would have been scared to death to work with Charles Bronson. <laughs> <laughs> no, Charlie was such a great guy. Oh. I did three films with him. Yeah. Um, yeah, he, he, I don't know what it was. He, he saw me, I can only think he saw me in Pendulum. 
and he did a film. He did an iconic film. He wanted me to do it, which I didn't do. I didn't get to do it. And uh, he was a little ticked off about that. The only reason I know this, and I didn't know him at the time, we had the same PR guy yeah. mm. at the time. And, uh, and I'm sorry I didn't get to do it because it would have been a wonderful thing. Anyway, I got to work with him on Death Wish 2. And when he heard that I accepted the part, he came right down the set and came right up high and said, Charles Monson. I said, hi. And the first thing he said to me, you haven't changed in 10 years. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> the, first thing he, the very first thing he said to me, you haven't changed in 10 years. I said, well, thank you. I mean, I was a little thrown. I was like, because he apparently he had wanted to meet me and work with me. Wow! And, and I was thrilled. Are you kidding? Yeah. I mean, I mean I'm working with Charles Mars, and I'm thrilled to be honest. That work with him. Yeah. And uh, and Jill, by the way. Yeah, who, Jill. Uh, Lovely wife. Oh God, I know. I mean, they just became friends, and we just got along. I, you know, it's just some people in this business you hit it with, and you become life long friends yeah. even if you don't see each other I mean it just I just reconnected with David Ladd Alan Ladd's son he's a dear friend of mine who I met uh, years ago and we have stories and we talk like this all the time and go back you want to talk about a person who's got stories he grew up Absolutely. in this business you know and uh, so it's just great stories great stories with Charlie you know, he didn't say much. He didn't have to. Um, you know, I hadn't seen him for a while, and on second or third film, uh, he he had asked for me. Uh, the third film was Murphy's Law. Yeah. He had asked for me. And I went to the trailers, and I walked over to see him, and I'm standing there, and I was smoking then. He comes out, and he just looks at me and looks at me smoking. He goes, shakes his head, says, Robert. You know, so I said, Charlie, I'm still a smile. He just shook his head, man. And you knew his whole thing. That's the way he was. It was just uh, the, the way. I loved watching him on the set, how he kept alert to what was around him when we were in public. Yeah. He was very alert. And uh, if there was someone around he didn't like, they weren't there long. Right. You remind me of Charles Bronson and the fact that, that you're... A, a real person. Uh, I, I don't want to like embarrass you or anything, but we got a comment uh, from a listener, and it's a fan of yours, and it's somebody that you might have known on uh, Facebook. Uh, Tiffany will read what he said. But to give you an idea about what your fans think of you, this is one of your fans in the UK. Uh, he said, uh, wonderful news uh, about Robert being on the show. He's a fascinating, compelling individual. Enthusiasts of classic motion pictures, television movies, and episodic television from all around the globe really appreciate this wonderful journeyman actor. Um, I won't tell you, but he has mentioned on his page the lovely letters and inquiries that he gets from around the world. So I take it you get a lot of uh, fan mail, and, and basically what do they talk to you about? I, uh, it's just, it's funny because just recently I was receiving fan mail, um, a couple of months ago I got like eight or nine from Germany and wow. I've never filmed there. And I know a lot of my stuff plays there. Yeah. And just recently I've get, been getting a lot of stuff from all over, uh, the States and some from upstate New York where I'm from, which, uh, not my hometown, but just, you know, just nice things. They just say lovely things. And uh, I think two of them, this I think you'll get a kick out of. I've got a good friend, and I also met him on Facebook. Two former Navy captains hmm. had requested a photograph, a signed picture of me. <laughs> <laughs> and one of them said, this will seem strange because I'm a man of however old he was, and he was retired. He said, but you must understand, on downtime, there's an awful lot of films brought aboard, and we watch films, which I didn't know. Yeah. So these guys, when they have downtime, they're watching television and, and um, films. So he knew just about everything it did. And I went, oh, well, of course. So 
that was one. And the other one, I actually somehow we wound up on Facebook, and I will say hello to him all the time. We we talk like we're neighbors, uh, mm-hmm. and and I really appreciate that. I mean, it was like wow, these guys on their downtime, they're watching films mm-hmm. and uh, floating around on the ocean. Right. <laughs> Why not? Well, uh, so I just. What? I got a kick out of two reserves, two captains from the Navy. I got a kick out of that. <laughs> One more question uh, from our audience. Uh, they said, please ask Bob about his thoughts on working on David Nutter's superb motion picture, Ceasefire, with Don Johnson and Lisa Blount, who were both great in the film. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Well, Lisa was a student of mine. I didn't know if you knew that. No, I didn't. Uh, oh, yeah, she was a student of mine. And uh, I had worked with Don on a TV show we did together. I think it was Matt Houston and Aaron Spelling thing. Because uh, he filled in for a, another actor who was originally going to do it named Chick Venera, who brought me in on it. And David, it was his first thing. He was just out of film school, I think, in Florida. Mm-hmm. And we shot it in Miami. And... Uh, I, I I don't know if anyone's going to get ticked off. I did a little bit of rewriting on the scene here and there. Uh, not a lot, but just some here and there. And, uh, you know, we just did hard work. I just really went to work and did a lot of research because, um, I don't know, I felt so badly about the guys from Vietnam. And it was written from the guy uh, who was also the producer, uh, George Fernandez. And it was written, and he had been there. And he never really talked about it. So I had to talk to a lot of guys about it. I did a lot of homework. Uh, I got to the point, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to do any more homework. I, uh, my, uh, I even got a plaque from Vietnam. So it was making me an honorary Vietnam veteran. I got to tell you, I'm wow. even embarrassed to say that mm-hmm. because I, these guys were there. Right. And because of the film, some of them thought I was there. Yeah, And that was the greatest validation, meaning, okay, they accepted me as one of their own. And I, they wanted me to give talks and what have you. I thought that was terrific. Uh, that um, I could talk to them and, and I really believed in their their uh, fight to try to return to their life and to get it back together again. It's uh, it's a it's a very heavy story. It's it's not pleasant, and um, and what they went through coming back is uh, was not not like today. These guys were treated terribly yeah. on their return. So it's it's not it's not a uh, it's not a happy story. The happy part was. The, when you can do something about it, make somebody feel good about what they've done. And I did uh, a few uh, Vietnam stories. I did one of the first on TV on a thing called Young Lawyers. That was a TV show back in that time. And I think I played one of the first television shows of a guy that had returned and was having all the problems he was having. And in fact, former, what was it, Agnew, Vice President Agnew. He had seen the Stur show and actually made a comment on it that it was not good. Mm. But, uh, you know, I mean, this guy was fired anyway from his job, so take yeah. that for what it's worth. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it's a, a great thing. I mean, you know, fans are great and everything, but to be respected by uh, people that are real, true American heroes like that, you know, uh, the Vietnam vets and, and military, and uh, uh, that's a real badge yeah. of honor for you. Well, to sit down and talk to them and really get into what they experienced, yeah. I gotta tell you, it takes some confront uh, to know what they did and what they got into. The writer of Ceasefire had been captured at one point. He never said anything until we were filming one day and he pulled me aside and he said, I gotta tell you this. And he told me what happened and that he was tied behind him, back and they were walking him somewhere, and he knew he was coming close to where his guys were hiding. Yeah. 
And uh, then he started running when all the insanity broke loose by his, you know, firing what I mean. I, and he just, he wanted to tell me that. And he went, and he walked away on the set, and I'm going, Jesus Christ, George, whoa. Okay. Um, it was like, um, uh, I don't know, he just felt the need that maybe what he had to say would give me some idea yeah. or get a sense of what was going on. It's a very intense scene that I have with Don and I. It's just Don and I in a bar and we're both drunk as hell. And um, it's a wonderful scene, by the way. <laughs> it was well made. Yeah. And David was terrific. He, for his first film out, he was just terrific. I love David. I haven't seen him in a long time. He became a very good director here. Uh, I just haven't seen him for a while. I worked with him again on Roswell some years later. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, this is a terrible segue, but, but I've got to mention a, a few guilty pleasures of mine as as we wrap this up. Now, you've done a lot of things as well as writing and, of course, acting, but you were a, a producer on Girls Just Want to Have Fun. Is that right? <laughs> oh, where do you get this stuff? We find all the dirt. You know, that's the way it works. Oh, my God. I, I think if you check the titles... Uh, you'll see it says associate. <laughs> there you go. And, uh, and uh, I only found out when an associate producer was la- after the fact. Uh-huh. That's not what I did. Years ago, apparently, an associate producer on a movie during the days of the studios, he was the one that did post-production. Yeah. He's the one that set it all up. He ran it, what have you. That's all I've been told. I do not have that for a fact. But that's what an associate producer did is that it was the post-production and wrapping it up what I did was I co-directed and helped the director uh, Alan Metter is what I actually did and I just came up with ideas I had a friend of mine who was a VP at that studio at the time and they knew something was going on it was his first film and in four days something wasn't right so I went and looked at the uh, dailies. They asked me when I look at the dailies. And I said, yeah, that's right. And it's very obvious when you've done a lot of films, no matter what your role is, you get to know film. Sure. You get to see what should be there. <laughs> if you know what a scene is for, then you look for what should be there. And I looked at the dailies, and I'm seeing a lot of stuff missing. That's all I saw was the actors weren't talking, the sets weren't being used well, the camera wasn't moving, just things that uh, you come to know. So I went down and gave them my notes and they put me on and I said, gee, this is a tough job, guys. Uh, I don't want to scare this guy, I want to help him. Right. You know, because right away, oh, your thought of is you want his job. I would never do that to yeah. anyone, I couldn't care less. I was accused of it. I presented it I said there's not what's happening that's not what I care about I would never do that my ethics would not allow me to do that and if I thought I couldn't prove it or do something I would have turned the job down Mm -hmm. it was uh, a healthy job it paid extremely well I loved it and uh, after a while um, everyone could see I was just there as a helping hand I would make suggestions and I would correct things and just by getting the camera people to move and get the camera, they took off and that was what they wanted to do anyway. Right. How to use a set. If the set is correctly chosen, it will help to tell the message of the scene. Right. That's what sets it for. Well, a lot of, arbitrary. A lot of those films are, are fly by the seat of your pants. You get somebody that's, God, been around Gregory Peck and all this and that. <laughs> you come in there, it, it, it's like bringing you know, some guy that's like a classic film director in on a John Waters film, <laughs> if, if I can say. But you were even miscellaneous crew. Now, what were you doing with Transylvania 6-5000? Oh, wow. Well, well, the same company, because I had done well with them, sent me over there. It was another first-time director, Rudy DeLuca. Um, it was a comedy. And I was just... Um, 
I kept saying, what is it you want me to do? And they said, well, you're the company eyes. And I went, what the hell is that? What, am I a cop? <laughs> <laughs> so I called her. I said, you must tell me. Give me a function. I can't just stand around. I got to know what it is you expect from me. And, and then I sat down with one of the execs, a wonderful guy. And, and he said, look, make sure that the script remains the same and that things aren't the same. Anything you can do to help with um, uh, Rudy who was a wonderful director, um, first-time director, and he's a funny guy. He worked a lot with, um, oh, uh, well, anyway, he, he had done some, a lot of comedy mm -hmm. right. and uh, a terrific guy. So I, I would put my two cents in on, on what happened. But one day we were filming, and it had to do with Transylvania Secret had to do with a mysterious doctor who was doing things and it looked like Frankenstein monsters and everything. It wasn't. It was just people who was trying to help. So it was a comedy based on that earlier Frankenstein stuff. Right. And um, they were doing a thing where Frankenstein arrives and this kid couldn't do it. And I'm standing there. So I said, oh, geez, we've got to do this and get out of here. Do you want me to do it? And I figured no one's going to see me anyway. It's a two-second scene. You'll get a kick out of this. So it's like this door crashes open, and I'm on the door screaming, yeah! And <laughs> I went, great. It's a two-second scene. Nobody will even notice it's me, right? right. I got a notice in variety. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful to see. <laughs> wonderful to see Robert F. Lyons in a comedy. Wow. I am on screen for about four seconds. And uh, and on uh, ceasefire, I couldn't get that kind of thing going <laughs> at first. <laughs> Isn't that incredible? <laughs> oh my! This was shot in Yugoslavia, which doesn't even exist anymore. And then you get you get people like us that bring up all these little hidden gems that you've done, <laughs> and you think people don't know, but they definitely right. know. Well, I, I have a I have another question uh, from our listeners. They wanted me to ask you about a, a TV film that you did called The Strange Possession of Mrs. Oliver. Now, of course, this was with Karen Black and George Hamilton, but what really stands out to me, and, and you can comment on, as an actor, I'm sure this makes a difference, but this was written by Richard Matheson, who was known far and wide for being an incredible writer, had worked with the likes of people like Rod Serling. So what was it like working on that project and, and the writing? Oh, good. I think it was a British director. I can't even remember his name. That was so long ago. But Karen was a friend of mine. I knew her. And uh, Somebody else I missed. Uh, I loved her so much. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I'd have to run that thing to look at it to really go, oh, yeah, I remember the things. I don't recall that I had that much to do acting-wise with it, and yet... Uh, there's only three or four characters in the whole damn thing, yeah. right. uh, as we call. And uh, uh, it was pleasant. It was nice to work with. I know that um, I think I drove the British director nuts <laughs> uh, uh, by coming up with ideas, and he would just say, Robert, just do what you want. <laughs> <laughs> Some do that. Some actually do that. No, I mean, no. I worked. I've worked with some. Uh, the most validated thing was on a uh, uh, that wine country thing we did, Falcon Crest. Yeah, and a wonderful director by the name of Michael Priest, who used to be a um, script person. You know, script person on the set. They really know what shots you need. And he became a director, and they become very good directors. And I said, Michael, I can do this whole thing here. Do you want me to do this? And, that? and he said, Robert. <laughs> you were hired so we didn't have to have this conversation when I say action do what you want that kind of thing <laughs> and, and I, the stories like that are just so pleasant to, to go on well, this is a joy I love doing these things that we're doing now they're, they're fun they are fun uh, they're ple they are pleasant they are um because, I don't know, everyone says I should write the book. And I you go, should write the book. Do you ever do <laughs> like, like you ever you ever do those Hollywood collectible show things where you sign autographs to meet the fans? I have never done that. Uh, Jeffrey 
Lewis told me, hey, you got to do this. That's it's right. Uh, uh, I, I just never did it. Uh, I said, well, I, I don't know. I thought they were hiring actors who had done certain genres like westerns or, or uh, horror films. And I do have a few, um, you know, like I didn't, I never did Twilight Zone, but I did do Night Gallery. Yeah. Yes, I wanted to ask you about that. You got any memories of doing Night Gallery? Yeah, I do. It's, it's like one of those wonderful things where I was having lunch, like a hamburger at Universal. And the casting director at the time was Burt Metcalf. And he's going by, he said, Bobby, oh, I'm so glad I saw you. I'm going to call you raise. I got a great part for you. And I'm mumbling, mm, 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 okay, uh-huh. chewing a burger. And I thought, how wonderful to be sitting here and get a lead in such a, a new series. And it was fine. And it was co-starring Susan Strasberg, who a, was a wonderful gal. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I worked with her twice. And we did this thing. Uh, and it is a very popular, of the night hours, it's a very popular night hour. In fact, I think it's, it used to be when you went on IMDb under my name, the whole show was right there because it's only about a 20 minute show. Mm-hmm. Because yeah, it wasn't an anthology thing. They would have little short stories. Yes, it was an anthology. It was not uh, episodic. Uh, and I loved it. It was terrific. We had such wonderful time doing it. Um, Let me ask you, because I know he was only the host, was Rod Serling ever on set? I never saw him. I never met him. We wrote uh, back and forth, and mm-hmm. he thanked me. Um, and I said, thank you. I mean, you know, he got to work with Rod Serling. Yeah. Who, uh, heavy smoker. Uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, uh, our, you know, we just never physically. I love Night Gallery. It was unfortunate for Rod. We we had his daughter on the show because, of course, Rod's gone. And, and Rod didn't really have control over that show like he did Twilight Zone. So he was kind of out of place and, and not as happy with it. But it was a great <laughs> series. It definitely was. That's surprising that he didn't have control over it yeah. after coming up with Twilight Zone. Yeah. I mean, that was like... That was like a, a American first. Are you kidding? Yeah. It's still playing. I mean, to be working with Universal uh, back in those old MCA days, that was when some of the greatest things they, they put out for television back then. They were like the, the first big studio to put, you know, TV show where it was back in that era. But I've got to ask you one last thing, and that is, I, I know it was really a long time ago, way back early in your career, do you have any memories at all? I don't even know what you did on the show to where you worked uh, on the monkeys. Yes, I do. Okay, I a can lot we of hear? Memories on that. Yeah, of course, because that was the uh, that was back to Screen Gems. Uh, the monkeys, by the way, was not a group that the studio picked up. Those were like four or five guys they interviewed, mm-hmm. right? And chose which ones. Uh, and put them together as a band. And people don't know that. The reason I know it is because I was one of six people out of, I don't know, a couple of thousand kids. They, Screen Gems was trying to get a stable again, like the old studios. They were trying to bring that back mm-hmm. and then find uh, a series for us. They were doing all the half-hour kind of Bewitched, I Dream of Genie, mm-hmm. um, Oh, I forget some other. I think, I think they were doing Green Acres and stuff too. I'm not sure. I don't know if that. I don't recall that as being a uh, a Screen Gem show. Um, there was one with Pete Duel. Um, uh, Alias know, Smith uh, and Jones. I I I'm sorry. I don't recall it. I know that they did a thing with Don Murray. The out uh, uh, not not Don Murray. He did the Outcast. It was with um, Dale Robertson. Um, oh, God, the train thing. Iron Horse. Mm, yes. I did one of those. And um, so they were trying to find a series for each of us. And there was a guy named P.J. Peeker. She got a series. Bridget Hanley, she got a series. Yeah. P.J. Peeker and Bridget Hanley, two of my loves that I was in love with. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, we all sat and watched each other's screen tests 
tests. We all had to do a screen test to get in there. We did meetings, you did things with different actors, and then you finally got a screen test. And I was given a screen test, literally a screen test. And it was interesting because I had met people later on who had said, I voted against you. I'm going, what? <laughs> I didn't think. <laughs> yeah, literally. Well, thank I you. Got, I said, what? I was shocked. He said, no, I didn't think. It's not that you were a bad actor, but we do all this comedy, and you look so damn serious. I said, I could do comedy? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know. But there was another guy there named Swackhammer, E.W. Swackhammer. Who, said, who married Bridget kid. Hanley. You got it. Yeah. And he, he's the one that said, take him. And they went, why? He said, take him. <laughs> and I said, why? Well, if you do a Western, you do something, you want him, and you've got him. And they went, okay, and they gave into it. So they took me, and uh, the three guys and three three girls they took. So there were six of us. And uh, in six months, I was out with a pink slip. And mm-hmm. I went up and knocked on Jackie Cooper's door, who was the president of Screen Gems at the time. Right. Knocked on the door. And said, hey, you said two years, pal. How come? Right. And he said, come on in, kid, come on in. <laughs> and we had a whole talk. Jack, the reason I bring it up is Jackie then, 10 years later, directed me in a lead comedy pilot. The last detail. Wow. Mm-hmm. I know, quite a story. And, and, and he was Uncle Fester. We got to remember that. <laughs> and he started. He started out with Charlie Chaplin and the kid. I mean, no. wow, talk about classic. But what did no. you do? Do you remember yeah. what you did with the monkeys? I mean, were you like one of one of the kids that hung around them? Or we've heard a lot of wild stories from the set of that series. There, we heard no. there's a lot of sex and drugs on that <laughs> on that set. I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> The thing is with the monkeys is they were working. You see, the six of us were on the lot walking around, meeting different people, trying to get jobs. Right. I mean, it was funny to be on a lot, being paid every week, and still have to look for work. And we were standing there looking at each other like idiots. The monkeys were already shooting. I did do an episode called Monkeys in the Ring. Um... And the director of that, James Frawley, I think he just passed away last year. Um, I had fun. I'm not on film that much, but it was one of those short ones I did. Mm -hmm. I mean, like Sally Peel. We all knew Sally. We'd go over to that set. She'd be hanging off of wires all day. (laughs) Hey, Sally, we look. Hi. Hi. She was just a (laughs) kid. The gal that played uh, the mother superior was, uh, uh, she wanted to play my mother on... um, um, the first feature I did at that studio, by the way, Pendulum. Yeah. Uh, I, I tell you, it's wonderful how everything kind of works out for you as an actor. The things that work here, there, but you're back at that studio working. My first two feature films were at that same studio that hired me to be under contract for six months and then gave me my pink slip. Now, when we're talking about the, the monkeys, now that was Sunset Gower, wasn't it? That's it. Yeah, they did. That's, they did three Stooges crazy. comedies there too. We got uh, both Tiffany and I got to got to work at Sunset Gower, and just all that history that was there—you could just feel it, you know. I mean, it was incredible. You you are right. There yeah. is tremendous history. Yeah. I mean, it just is like that's that's Capra's country. You know? yeah. He's the one that like. He raised that studio up yeah. into a first-class studio. Mm-hmm. I mean, to it was not looked at as, you know, like MGM or Universal. Cap was the one that got that up there. Yeah, for sure. You know, he did things like it, it happened one night uh, with Gable. Gable didn't want to do it. He was a bad boy. So the studio said, we'll fix you. You can go work at the Columbia. Uh, and then it wound up winning Oscars, you know. I mean... Yeah. Uh, Capra put that studio into its first class um, quality. Right. One of the greatest directors it's ever, my, Frank Capra, for sure. Well, I'll tell like you, book, you are name an inc- above the t- What was that? Yeah, go ahead. I was just going to no, say that. Go, oh, okay, go ahead. No, it's the book, uh, Name Above the Title. It's a great book by Capra. 
and I recommend anybody read it yeah. because it's he says it's more of a handbook of what to do when you arrive in Hollywood. Right. <laughs> it's a wonderful book. Well, you are definitely an encyclopedia of old Hollywood, and it's been such a great pleasure talking to you. We can only scratch the surface of, of things that you have done, and we definitely want to have you back on. I want to get you and Jesse here in the studio sometime after all this madness is over with. Because, oh, uh, that would be fun. Oh, that man. That would be great. That would be fun. Uh, the all last right. time, I, I, Jesse, yes, we, uh, we had dinner at Moscow, uh, uh, at uh, Musso Franks, and then we had some tea and coffee somewhere over here in the valley. And I haven't seen him since. We talk every once in a while on the phone and uh, or say hello on uh, Facebook. And, uh, you know, I mean, we go back to this I mean, in a long time. Yeah. Uh, wow. Yeah. Well, we'll have, to, we'll have to get both of you over here because I already promised Jesse that I'd make him a home-cooked meal, so... Oh, wow. <laughs> and what are you serving? I just want to know, Tiffany. I, I don't know. <laughs> we'll figure it out at that point. I, I make a mean homemade lasagna. A what? Uh, a very good homemade lasagna. That's fine. I'm not a fish guy. I'm just going to warn you. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, Robert, we want to thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I, where can uh, fans of yours connect with you? I'm assuming just over on Facebook. Where's the best place for them to keep up to date with you? Yeah, uh, Facebook is fine. Uh, I don't know. Uh, it's an odd question. I don't know how uh, odd to me. I don't know where to, for people I don't know, I wouldn't know what to tell them. Um, uh, I don't have a P.O. box right now. Uh, and it's funny. I don't know how people get my address. I get all this stuff that comes right to my door now. Wow, um, really? <laughs> Facebook, I guess, is the best. Uh, I do spend some time on that. And I like to. I like to keep uh, seeing what's going on. If the planet's still there in the morning when I wake up. <laughs> like that. Right. You, you never know. I mean, it's a distinct yeah. possibility. Especially these days. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, thank hey, you. Listen, this has been. Yeah, you guys are terrific. I don't know how the hell you get the homework you did or where. How do you do that? Uh, <laughs> unless you were ex LAPD or something like that, <laughs> but you're good at it. Thank you. You're good at it, and and you really made this fun. This all feels like it's been about three minutes. Yeah. So I've really enjoyed this. Thank, thank you, you so much. Absolutely, we've had a blast chatting with you, and I'm sure we will keep in touch. Okay. All How right. can I hear this thing? I, is there a way? Yes. Uh, in about, in about uh, probably within the next 24 hours, we actually take the live show and we put it up in an on-demand uh, website, and I'll send you a link so you'll be able to not only listen to it yourself, but you can share it with anybody who didn't catch it live. Ah, uh, thanks, Tiffany. Thank you. You guys are terrific. You do your homework. That's wonderful. And, and, you are yeah. pros. Yeah, yeah. Some people's not real tech savvy. I don't know about you, but we could also send you a CD too if if you need one of the interview. So. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thanks, babe. All right. All well, right, man. thank you so much, Robert. Uh, we've had so much fun, and I hope you have a great rest of your weekend. Yeah. You too. Stay well, both of you. Thank you, you very, too. very much. Absolutely. All right. Bye. Right, bye. Good night.